All right. So, Gordon, Reagan, thanks for uh, joining. And um, so what I'd like to talk about, I mean, first of all, just to make it very clear, I've known Gordon for a while. Um, we've um, actually both are from New Jersey. That's right. Yeah. Both from New Jersey, both near the Asbury Park area. Yeah. That's a pretty... Uh... Awesome place to be from, that's for sure. The home to Bruce Springsteen, Bon Jovi, and other acts. The thing is, I never really connected myself. I never yeah. really connected to the Asbury Park scene mm -hmm. because I grew up with Guns N' Roses, Poison, Sure. Motley Crew, and they were like the LA, LA. Mm -hmm. glam sunset strip scene, right? Sure, right? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I think Dean, you and I probably were coming into play around the same time, and and Reagan maybe a little bit after that, but Asbury Park, you know, since uh, well, for quite some time through the forties and fifties was a mecca for all kinds of things and all kinds of different styles of music. Um, but of course, after, you know, your the Southside Springsteen era, uh, it solidified our area in Monmouth County and the Jersey Shore as one of the greatest musical capitals of the world. Um, and pound for pound, ounce for ounce, uh, we have probably some of the most successful um, neighborhood musicians in the world. Um, because we have such a high success rate and small amount of musicians compared to your Nashville's or LA or New York or what have you, you know, but we also have, you know, the Hoboken scene and you got Atlantic city and, uh, Asbury park has been an incredible hub for so many of us and touring bands through all the years, they would always come and play it. You know, Mrs. J's and the stone pony and the fast lane, you know, U2's first American show and many others was at the fast lane in Asbury Park. People don't even realize that crazy. Oasis first American show was at the Stone Pony, I believe. You know, like uh, we've been blessed to have this in our backyard. We took full advantage of it. So how did you both as well, well, first of all, Gordon, you grew up in the Asbury Park scene playing in variety of artists. I'm yeah. sorry, variety of bands. Yeah. And they were all kind of influenced. I mean, it seems like whatever band that you were in, it kind of was a very rootsy kind of act, whether it sure. was kind of like, you know, a mixture between like the Eagles, Bruce Springsteen, kind of a lot of big harmonies. Yeah. Ret retro, retro, right? Yeah. I mean, is, is that right or is that wrong? Well, no, that's the, that's not a bad way to put it. You know, what it's called now is country. It's funny. Our, our first band called Mr. Reality, three piece storytelling song, big harmony band, like you said, based on Eagle CSNY, our heroes from the area, et cetera. Uh, um, you know, now uh, at the way my career has evolved and Reagan's, that's what they call country music now. If, if. Back in the day, you know, uh, 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 Bruce Springsteen came out or, or um, a Jackson Brown or an Eagles. If they came out now, you know, they would be your Keith Urban's and Eric Church's and, and uh, Little Big Town. You know, I mean, that's what that music is. Story songs and, you know, um, great presentations and great singing, you know, which, of course, is key to all of this uh, as presentation. So let me ask you this. When you, earlier in, in, in your band days, do you think it would have benefited you from being in a different scene? Or do you think this was the right scene for your bands? Well, that's a great question. You know, That is a great Reagan, question. When Reagan started, she became part of the Les Paul family in New York. And she started singing, well, Rage, you tell me. Yeah, I mean, my story is a little different than Gordon's in the sense that I um, I went to, you know, my mom was a big band singer and uh, I started writing songs when I was you know, four or five years old. And um, early on, I moved to Nashville and um, I did, a, you know, I, you know, had a development deal down there. 
I came back here because my mom had sung with Les Paul back in the day. And so then I ended up coming to New York because she says, I want to introduce you to Les Paul. So I go and I ended up uh, singing with him for a while. Actually, for the last four years before he died, I did a, a lot of pretty incredible uh, things with him out in Los Angeles and New York at Roseland um, and at the Iridium where he played on Monday nights. Um, it's very different, um, but it is a good question in the sense that, I mean, would things be different depending on where, where your, uh, where your area was? Um, for me, I sort of jumped around a lot. Um, you know, I just sort of got my feet wet in a lot of different areas. I, I sang backup for a lot of people. As a matter of fact, that's sort of my day job. Um, you know, I'll sing backup for different acts when they come to town. Uh, for example, like David Gray, he's doing the Today Show. He doesn't want to bring his band over. Okay, so, you know, I'll go and I'll do the Today Show or, or you know, various people. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you know, Social Distortion, same thing. You know, they came, they came from uh, out California. They did Stone Pony Summer Stage. And, you know, get a call. Can you can you join them? And so that's kind of so it's kind of a little different for me than than for Gordon. Um, and basically sort of like my roundabout way answering your question is, um, you know, I kind of feel like things happen for a reason. Uh, came back to town from Nashville. My dad had been ill, started singing with Les Paul and started to sort of get back into uh, in this area, really writing and, uh, you know, because everything I had been in Nashville at that point and um, Gordon and I were put on the same um, uh, concert, which was a Restore the Shore Benefit after Sandy. And uh, we just started kind of talking a lot about, you know, about our lives and what, you know, what our musical lives had been and what our experiences were and um, just sort of connected that way. And so I don't know for me what it would have been like, um, you know, at this point currently. Uh, but I just think things happen for a reason. And, and, you know, Gordon's experiences has led him to this point right now, as have mine. And I feel we're like in a really, really good place right now. So you feel that you're in the appropriate scene at the time. For me, my scene was, was very different. I think that's more of a Gordon question because of the fact that he had such, such um, foundation here you know i mean you you know i I'm, I'm at his house and he's he's pulling out different uh you know boxes and and you know you're i'm seeing all these these magazines and and posters and 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 you know like uh, uh sam goody big posters of of mr reality and highway nine and so his his feet were really really and and you know of course from this area and that was a it was a huge deal um you know mr reality highway nine and and, and them, you know, breaking out, like I saw one of the covers on the East Coast Rocker or something saying, you know, you know, band, you know, signs to Epic Records or signs to EMI. And, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things that um, uh, he, he was really, really planted in this area. So I feel like that question is definitely, you know, you come from you, you're from where you're from. And I think that he's worn that on his sleeve and he's used all of that. Um, to get him, you know, where he is today. And I think that that's really what helps tell his story. So um, I'm going to answer for him and say, I think that he definitely, that's where he, he needed to be. And if he differs from me, then, you know, perhaps, but, uh, but I bounced all over the place. So I, I, you know, I can't say that I really had um, uh, one particular places scene that I was in other than, other than Nashville um, at, at, uh, during the, the late nineties and into the two thousands. So. What's really interesting today is I don't think that a scene, in a sense, no longer really exists, right? I mean, we had these, <laughs> I mean, when I lived in New York for a while in the East Village, you still could smell like the previous roots of the punk scene in CBGBs, I mean, the Ramones and... And this was in like early 2000, but it was going away. Yeah. But you could still see like the, the footprints of that culture. I mean, I have not been in that area for a long time, but I could imagine I wouldn't even recognize it. Well, you know, I think that it's, it, it's so interesting you say that you can watch. I mean, well, first of all. Uh, social media and all of this that is that has taken things to to a to a level that's so 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 different from even you know 
10, 15 years ago. Uh, you can see an artist and see, you know, a million things of what they've put on and you might not know where they're from or where they're playing next. And, you know, but like you said, you know, do you go to New York or you, you go walk down the streets of LA? I mean, you, you watch, you watch a, a, a thing like the decline of Western civilization and you see that whole scene and what it was like. And that's the real deal, you know, and same with New York. And um, I agree with you. I don't necessarily, um, I, you know, I don't necessarily know that that exists. I, I don't, I don't know if it will ever exist like that. If it does, it's going to be people going, you know, Hey, you know, sort of doing their homework going, wow, this looked really cool. Well, we want to get that back again, but you know, Nashville has a little bit of it. You know, I do think it, there's de there's definitely a scene in Nashville, but even that to an extent is changing with the fact that it's become Nashville's really become the new, the new Los Angeles. I mean, it really is people are leaving LA and they're going to Nashville. So I would say the scene now, um, you know, it, it, when I moved to Nashville, it was like, everybody said, you know, from Jersey, you moved to Tennessee. Why you moved to Tennessee? And, um, now I just feel like every time somebody says they're moving to Nashville, I'm like, uh, okay. You know, it's like, it's like what people said about LA. Yeah. I think, so you know, the matter oh, is, to add on that, sorry to interrupt you is, you know, the business is changing so quickly and evolving. So, so fast. There are no musicians left everyone is really moving to nashville it started in los angeles you know 10 years ago i mean you just kept seeing everybody move to town move to town move to town move to town i'm a songwriter i mean it's always been like that but everyone has migrated from la and new york now yeah and and nashville is not just country music anymore you have east nashville you've got all of the great rock bands now that are based in you know americana the americana fest is in nashville i mean uh, the word roots, as you had mentioned before, it's, you know, it's incredible how much music there is now. Now, country music is still king in Nashville, and that's why we love it. And it's our second home. Um, but you've got everything. I'm mean, Paramore is from Nashville. I mean, you've got King great, Leon. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. Forget it. There's tons, tons and tons. So you mentioned that there's no musicians left. Right. Well, just... I, I take. I take that. It's not that there's none. It's just a good portion of people, working musicians, have tried to make their careers uh, Nashville-based now. Got it. Okay. No, because I thought you actually had a point there for a second. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just crazy. It, it's just crazy wrapping your mind around how, you know, we talked about scene and like how you know, there, there was the LA scene, Seattle scene, New York scene, Atlanta, right? Right. Nashville. Absolutely. And, and, but what's crazy is that people who, whatever zip code they lived in, they emulated to their scene. Like yeah. they, right. That was the main influencer. Well, I can, I can tell you from our experience with, the, I was in a band called Highway Nine and, you know, we were signed to Sony, Epic Sony and, we made our record in Nashville because we had all of the country influence in the world. And we went there to do that. When we came home and we said to Epic, we want to put out our country record. They're like, no, no, we're going to put you out at rock radio. I'm like, but we're not going out against corn and limp biscuit. That's not going to happen for us. We're from New Jersey. And you know, the acts that we like, or, you know, at the time you had just Dixie chicks and rascal flats. And, you know, a lot of that stuff was like, that was, who we were. Um, and so we left and got signed to RCA Nashville and actually moved there then. So, I mean, we have been watching it since that time. That was in the early 2000s when all that was happening. Well, it's funny you say that too, because talking about scenes and, and people really sort of <clears throat> associated with those scenes, you know, you talk about like, you know, New York, you know, had the Beastie Boys and, 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 and California, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Seattle, obviously all those guys, you know, Allison Chains and you had Atlanta, obviously REM. And like I said, again, now you're not even really sure where a lot of these people scene is. And I think basically what we're trying to do, Williams Honor, is bring it to a point where we are trying to, and that's why your question is, is really, really, um, relevant to what we're doing is we want to have an association with the scene and kind of almost if that scene is not really in the forefront, we want to create that. And we want to shove it down people's throats. Like, Hey, okay. We sing country music, country rock, you know, oriented. And we're from Jersey just because we're from Jersey does not 
doesn't mean we don't know how to write a country song. It doesn't mean we don't understand country music. It doesn't mean we lo- don't love it. it. doesn't mean, I mean, and it's, and it's 1000% authentic. And I get into this with a lot of people. So well, how can you be from Jersey and, and love country music? Why can't you? I mean, why can't you? I mean, it depends. First of all, my family, my mom and dad were from Pittsburgh. My dad used to drive to, you know, down like through the, the mountains area in, in Pennsylvania to get the Opry in on his, uh, in his car. And uh, so I grew up listening to his stories about listening to country music. And then we, we get in our station wagon and we'd be, you know, on road trips listening to Marty Robbins. I could sing you the whole Marty Robbins backwards and forwards. Um, you know, so to me, um, we want to scream from the rooftops that we sing country music. We understand it. We love it. We're from Jersey. We also, you know, obviously we spent a lot of time in Nashville. We've lived there. We've recorded there. We've worked there. Um, and there can be the connection of both. So when it ta- you talk about a scene, um, a scene, we really want to say, yes, we, we want to create the scene. And if it's, if it's, you know, people are having a hard time wrapping their head around it. Well, that's what we're here for. That's why we want to explain what it's from. Let's give somebody a textbook 101 of what we want to create and what, what we're about and what we'd love to educate people on. If it's something that, you know, something that they're, they're not in the, in the know of, you know? So during the pandemic, I mean, I mean, like two years ago, artists are touring, they're doing their thing. And all of a sudden you get two weeks to flatten the curve. Artists stop their tours South by Southwest cancels. I remember I was actually in, I was in Texas during that time, not for South by Southwest though. Everyone's like, oh, you got to check. I was actually in Austin right before South by Southwest was starting for actually a family gathering. Had nothing to do do with South by Southwest. Yeah. That South by Southwest turned into like tech companies anyway. I mean, uh, it it abandoned music and all that. So I, something that really doesn't interest me, but, um, yeah, I heard that South by Southwest canceled their event a couple of days before it was starting. And then, of course, it forced all artists and musicians off the road. With that, how, first of all, what was your initial reaction? Like, like just, just in, in a couple, like, how did you react when you found out you're not playing shows? Gordon? Well, man. We had quite a pivot, didn't we, Rach? We did. Why don't you tell them about? Well, you know, at that time we had um, we had really started to think about releasing our uh, uh, new record, um, and you know we had a lot of big plans for things. We had just left Nashville, actually, and um, we were only back from Nashville for about oh, I don't know, maybe about two weeks um in that time uh nashville had a uh a huge tornado so we found ourselves in asbury park doing the uh saint patrick's day parade float as we they put us on a float and we sing our williams honor songs down the down the our new avenue. Songs on a float going yeah. down bookman avenue and about to do a benefit for the tornado yeah, we, we actually went to uh, uh danny clinch and we um we put together a benefit for the, for the Nashville, um, the a tornado. And we did a Williams honor, did a, did a really cool show. And we sat down and we did an interview and we, we did a show and that was it. That was the, the very last thing that we did in, in person for, for quite some time. And that was so many other people said the same thing. We've heard so many times like that, uh, that, that Nashville benefit you did at, at uh, the clinch uh, gallery was the last thing we did. You know, we heard that from so many people, um, you know, it's a scary thing uh, because obviously, you know, people are fighting for their lives. People are losing their lives and people are just trying to stay alive really. And just, just, you know, this, nothing has been experienced in our lifetime like this. So all of a sudden you start thinking to yourself, I mean, it's really a mind thing where you're like, Oh my gosh, you know, do, are people even going to care about entertainment when, you know, you're watching the news and you're seeing, you know, body bags on the streets. Like how do you, how, how do you, you know, even, but, but, you know, but, but I think right now, speaking about that, I think right now that we're living in a very, very hostile culture. You said right now, do people care about entertainment? I, I don't think people care about entertainment as, as much as they used to in America. I'm not going to say this worldwide because 
the main thing that drives America is politics. Well, that is true. I that mean, true. you, I, you know, listen, I have a daughter. I take her to the playground and all I hear from people is politics. I hear Putin. Now I hear COVID. I hear sure. masks. I hear stay home. I hear Ukraine, Putin, right, COVID, right. mask, Ukraine, Putin, you know, so like if it's not Putin, COVID, mask, stay home, who are you voting for? It? Like there's no topic of conversation. It wasn't like, oh, so, you know, did you hear that like singer in American Idol or did you hear that new song? Or Well, you know? but there's there's also a reason for that as well. And 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 that's really an interesting point you make, too. I don't necessarily think it's that people don't care. There is no urgency anymore. There's no real time anymore for things. It used to be the Olympics. When you were young, you used to watch the Olympics. Everybody was sitting around. They're watching, you know, Nancy Kerrigan getting smacked on the knee. They're watching. So everybody's watching it. Everybody's now. I can see it. On, I can see it on YouTube tomorrow. They don't care. They don't care about seeing anything in real time. So there's not that quote unquote water cooler conversation because somebody hasn't caught up with it yet. And, and, you know, so I don't, I don't disagree with you in the sense that, um, that I think that obviously, yes, people are, are talking about a lot of other things, but I do think the fact that, that the way we get our entertainment, the way we get our news, the way we get our entertainment, the way we get our sports even is so, so, so different than it was even 10 years ago. That is true. That is true. No, there's no doubt that the way we consume entertainment, there's no doubt about that, that, there's an effect on that. But what I also think mainly what's driving why entertainment is not like the, doesn't have the cultural impact. It's because our country is creating a moral panic every second. Well, let me interject and say this. Go tell that to Morgan Wallen. Go tell that to Johnny Depp. Go tell that to artists that are going through their dramatic moments in their careers and ask them if the public is not reacting. It depends. It depends. Yeah. And, and some of that is uh, politically charged, you know, um, because of where we're at in this moment in time. Uh, not too different from the 60s, the late 60s, which I didn't get to experience. But I would think like the early 90s and late 60s, we are at one of those moments in time where there is so much going on about the way people feel about their lives and you know uh, our economy and politics. I will say this, not enough musicians are expressing it and they're not putting it in their music to really supercharge some of that entertainment value. Well, I do think that people, I think people will always, you know, whether there's a lot of politically charged and, and yes, those things are coming, rolling off the tongues of people. The bottom line, I feel, and I think the pandemic was proof of that. People will always want their entertainment. Um, they, for starters, they look to entertainment for, for their therapy, for their sidekick, their, 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 their morning coffee. That's their entertainment. And William's honor, um, you know, like you said, you know, we're, we're, what were you saying when this happened? Yeah, we love. We're, we're going to hit the stages again. Well, we didn't know when we were going to hit a stage again. Um, so what we did is what we know how to do, and that's um, just try to connect with people that have supported us and and people who didn't know us, and turned on our our phones and we did a live stream and we just you know we just did what we do. Nothing scripted. You know, it turned out people would do people would start to do these live streams and you know, as time went on and they had all the bells and whistles, you know, 15 cameras and this, that, and the other. We never did that. We put on the camera. We had a banner behind us that was put up with duct tape and, you know, a couple, it would fall. And then all of a sudden, you know, it became the thing. It became the thing that people would be laughing. Your banner's hanging down, you know, there's a hot mess going on. My dog would be, you know, barking, you know, things were falling. Everything was a mess and it worked. And you know what we realized? People didn't want perfection during the pandemic because nobody knew what their lives were. Nobody knew what was going on. And, you know, we're, we're dealing with it just the way everybody else was. Um, the only difference was we were just trying to make sense of it. And, and we wanted to uh, just really entertain people. And that's what we did. We did a two hour variety, almost like a variety type, like an SNL, hee-haw, 
uh, unplugged storytellers. Well, so let me ask course. you this. The so, phone just fell, so there that that's <laughs> very typical of My that. My phone just died too, so I'm holding it and plugged it in. Well, <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned about during the pandemic. Now, and Gordon, you mentioned about Morgan Wallen. Morgan yep. Wallen. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so here's the thing. Where do you stand in all that? I mean, obviously. I will never discuss my politics because I have some very distinct views about it and as williams honor we're not here to do that so well, i'm not I'm actually talking about politics i'm actually but my point was in politics oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what 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 what, I, what my mean what i actually yeah. point was you mentioned it because morgan wallen it wasn't yeah. about politics with him it was well, actually to him with the cancel culture thing right 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 but, say, but it yeah. wasn't but but like it wasn't like aaron lewis of Stained, who's like, okay, he has a yeah. politically driven message, right? Right. So right. Morgan Wallen was kind of canceled over a racial slur. Right. So, <clears throat> which didn't mean, yes. Right. So, but, but, but it benefited his career. I mean, the he fact is the biggest star in the world. Right. But go tell that to him in the heat of it when you're canceled off of Saturday Night Live, when you've got the biggest record in all the country music and you're about to become the next Tim McGraw and your agent leaves you, leaves you. Your label leaves you, you know, I mean, he, at the country music audience took to his he made a great uh, record and it couldn't get rec. It wasn't getting recognized because of that. Yeah. So my, right now, absolutely. I mean, he got, he got dropped by his agent, suspended by his label. And by the way, they're all phony balonies. They didn't oh, really drop when started his own company. And now he's got the biggest artist in the business. You kidding me? Right. They, so, they opened the tour at Madison Square Garden, sold out. Come on. Right. So so when the when when they all say, Oh, we're dropping him, they're not really dropping him. They're just trying to stay away from the firing squad, right? Sure. Well, you gotta stick together. Listen, if you come up in this business and you've got a team, you do what you gotta do to make the team work. And if you're a solo artist or a band, I learned this, you know, again, because of where we all come from. That's how I learned it, because that's what all of our heroes did from this area. You stick together, you do what you can. And, you know, some will fall by the wayside as you continue to move forward and others will stay with you. So as William's honor, like. What what's your truth? Like, what do you What's your goal as an act? I mean, do you want to just have people have a fun time and like take you away from the stresses of life? Do you want to have them walk away with, with something like, as you said, an idea, a belief. So. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Rates. I think you were starting to talk about that before. Um, Well, touching back with the, um, with the, the live stream that we did, you know, I think I think everybody in their life at that time learned something about themselves. They learned things about each other. And biggest thing and, and interesting question that you have is, is I think, you know, Gordon and I had been in a band at this point. We had already put out our record. We had done a radio tour. We had had a number, you know, 27 song. Um, we had opened up direct support for Bon Jovi. And we're still then in 2020 learning things about each other being you know being in the span because now we had something that we never experienced before and this was our you know our life together is williams honor music going out performing touring and all of a sudden we're like what are we going to do and doing this live stream really made us um party <laughs> just find out things that that, that that we knew all along but but we were able to put it into play and so we do this show and um, and as it turns out, it ended up being Pole Stars uh, number twenty four live stream of all of twenty twenty, and uh, I guess internationally. I mean, so it's like every week we would we would be our show would be, you know, here's like Carrie Underwood and uh, you know uh, all these big names. Miley Cyrus at one point was like number two, and like we're number like eight. Like, how does this make sense? But you know, it's just it, it was just. It's the way it happened like that. It was it was a very unpolished show. It was, and we found that um, <clears throat> that's really what we're about. And and I mean, I might be simplifying it. Um, of course, one yes, you always want people to have a good time. You want people to you want people to 
come to you in their time when they want to have fun. You want people to come to you in their time when they need a shoulder. You want people to come to you when they just want to take a drive and not think about anything. You want to be all those things to people. You want to be their friend, their, their, you know, bottle of, bottle of uh, whiskey. You want to be all that stuff. Um, you know, we, we say things that we say uh, and people take with it what they need to take. And we feel that over the years, especially <clears throat> obviously coming out with our first album and as Williams on her, obviously again, Gordon has had um, a very public, you know, in, in, in this area and, and elsewhere as well, but um, his music people to this day, to this day, people say about his record, like you have no idea. I still listen to that record. It speaks to me. And, you know, at, at the end of the day too, as much as Gordon and Reagan come out and we do the thing, you know, the sort of, like I said, this SNL stuff, which we enjoy doing. I, I grew up with that. You know, I Gilda Radner and, and all those people, they were, they were people I really loved watching. And, um, but at the end of the day, we write songs and those are the things that people take with them. And um, there's something for everybody, you know, this new record that we have, it's a, uh, we, we first started saying it was a breakup record and yes, it is. It's called X. But it's not necessarily a breakup where, you know, OK, I'm talking about all my exes. It's actually not about that at all, really. It's about um, things in your past, whether that be a person, whether it be a job, whether it be a place, whether it be your old self. Um, and we feel like everybody's especially coming out of especially out of coming out of 2020. How many people do you know that you feel have completely changed? And um, so we're always speaking to you know people through our music and and. Speaking of people through our stupid stuff too, but that's part of it. Um, so yeah, that is the key. And and to to really answer the question, you know what we're hoping and what we've always counted on, and why we even started. She, Dean, I'll be honest with you. She pulled me back into the band business. I was I was hired gun. I was out touring with people, making records for people. You know, playing guitar, doing whatever. I met Reagan Richards, and she got me back into the band business because she made me re-believe in the things that I once knew, okay? And that is write great songs, sing them, get into people's homes, get into their hearts, make them feel like they have someone that understands and be a part of their lives. That's what music did for us. And that's what we hope we continue to do for others. That's really the bottom line. And, you know, country music, people, you know, people think so many times like, oh, if, you, if I put a fiddle on this, that makes it country music. And that's a big misconception. That's not what makes a country country song a country song. What makes a country song is the lyric. And um, we write, you know, um, story songs. I mean, and that's like you said, bringing getting into people's homes, getting into people's heads. You know, when people come up to us, the song that we had that went to number 27 was the song No Umbrella. And it was really about just, you know you know, the age old thing where you have to allow yourself to feel pain in order to get to the other side, you know, so you can't sit there and bottle it up. You've got to let it out. So you're not going to get past that. And my God, after every show, we, we actually did a show up in um, uh, upstate New York and we were playing a place and all of a sudden we look and I was, I, you know, I sort of kind of noticed different things going on. And I see this, this person singing every word to the song. And I thought, wow, that's pretty awesome. I, I, you know, and at the end, um, she comes up, she comes up to us and she said, I can't believe you're the band that sings that song. She says, this is played on our radio station up here in, in upstate New York. And she said, this song connects so much with me. She says, I had to pull over my car and cry one day because it hit me so, so hard. She says, I cannot believe, because she was crying at, at the, at the place that we were playing. She says, I can't believe you're the band that, that had that song and you're actually playing it in front of me. That's the stuff that, that's the stuff that hits us and that gets us you know, putting pen to paper and writing a song every minute of the day, you know, that makes us, that drives us, you know, because we all need something um, to get us through moments, that, good or bad, you know, you know, when you're having a great time, you can't wait to go down the shore or, you know, you can't wait to get in your car, put the top down, put your favorite song down or a, or a song that reminds you of that feeling that you have. I have certain summer songs. I'm putting them on when I'm driving down the highway. So, you know, yeah, you mentioned about getting in people's homes. And uh, I actually think the music business is going under a major revolution, I think, right now. Yeah, we agree. Right. The, wor the world yeah. is not just the music business. All the, yeah. all the longstanding institutions mm -hmm. 
are going under revolution are revolutionizing. Sure. And getting back in people's homes. I mean, today. And when I when I said homes, I mean their heads and hearts too, because that's know, where their home. You know, I, I get it. But I'm yeah. actually talking about. But it's funny that you mentioned. It. Totally got it. Getting in their in their in their right in their mind and yeah. hearts and connecting. But I actually was having a discussion with a buddy of mine a couple, maybe it was like last or two weeks ago, that I think we're actually going to go back. Artists and musicians are going back into like living room kind of style. Oh, absolutely. I think for the last, I don't know. I mean, artists have been inundated with just focusing on streams and likes. And I think it's all done. I think it's to, I think that whole phase is moving away. You agree? Yeah. Um, man, it's so interesting. You know, we're extremely fortunate to have all of these tools, you know, at, at our beck and call all the time. You can build your own career out of your bedrooms now. But what's happening is all of this crazy manipulation. Um, I'm sure you see it all the time when you're, you know, doing the Kings of A&R stuff. There are lots of bought and manipulated numbers out there. And some of that stuff wins until you got to sell a ticket <laughs> and you got to have real people show up at the show. And that's when things get very funny. Um, but, you know, this always happens with technology when it moves forward. People can use it for uh, very positive things or they can manipulate it and try to get the most out of it. Um, we've done our best to try to keep things very, you know, foundational and make sure we're connecting with real people and that they're coming to shows and we're building a real career that sells a ticket. Um, otherwise, you know, you're basically playing to yourself, you know, and you're sitting there doing your socials for yourself. Um, we prefer to have a fan base and people that are a part of this with us. You know, you know what's a shame, Gordon, is that like no one has, there's no metrics in this business anymore. Not real ones. Not there's real been. ones. And at, exactly, not real metrics. But I want to tell you, not having real metrics has literally, it's been one of the destroyers of the institutions. Of not, and not just music, but this is across the board as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's really like, it's so fascinating. This is a, a constant conversation that all of us as musicians have to have with ourselves, you know, because all anybody says is, well, what are, what's your stream numbers? You know, what's your, how many likes you got? And that's great. And, uh, you know, when they are real numbers and people are um, interacting and you're seeing your brand build, it's great. Um and I'm not taking anything away from people that, you know, can buy their branding because it does cost money to do this stuff, especially when you have to hire teams to, you know, handle a lot of these marketing things. It's not different than what a label used to do. It's the same thing. It just works a little differently. And, you know, um, you know, when you've got like click farms and like all this stuff that's popping your numbers up so you can get to a, a Spotify playlist, we chuckle at that stuff, you know? Well, you know, Gordon, think about this. Like, it would be normal for an artist to say, here's what normal things look like. Yeah. It's normal for an artist to say, we, we play four different venues and we can bring in between 75 to 300 people at these venues. That's normal. Yeah. We have a thousand, we have a thousand subscribed mailing list. Yeah. That's normal. That's built up for over some time. You have a thousand people that subscribed on your mailing list. That's not far fetched. Okay. We sold or we had 5,000 streams on her song yeah that's not a red flag right now artists today i have 
5 million streams yeah. off my song. I have a half a million Instagram followers. Right. These are all red flags. Right. This is like, I mean, the IRS. To you, to you and I, yes. Like, I'll go to the show and see if five of those people buy a ticket. Most of the time, the ones that you're talking about, I don't see one person buying the ticket. So what happens then is the people that aren't fooled give them offers to do a jeans commercial, to uh, do a soup commercial, right? Because they have done their due diligence in the digital world. And so that is how things are evolving. Right. And you know what's crazy is because the numbers have been so inflated from like a normal, think about this. CNN introduced a new streaming show called CNN Plus. Oh, right. I saw. Right. And they got ridiculed. Yeah. Because they had 10,000 subscribers. Ridiculed. Now, Gordon, think about this. This yeah. is the biggest organization, not the biggest, one of the biggest media cable news channels yeah. that went on streaming site and got 10,000 subscribers. Guess what, guys? Hint, that's yeah. normal, normal. 10,000 subscribers, normal. Oh, yeah. but like I get someone who lives down the block from me who no one's ever heard of saying, oh, 10,000, I just got a million video streams. I'm like, like, that's what I'm saying. Everything yeah. has become so distorted. Look at look at Crazy. the groups that went diamond. Your yeah. diamond was 10 million. So diamond. That doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Well, 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 no, 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 well, but no, now an artist goes to a billion oh for streams of course yeah. right but but what they found out gordon that those billion streams mm -hmm. they found out that a large number of those a billion streams are the same people or same something streaming it over and over again absolutely. absolutely so 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 that billion streams is very suspect yeah oh my god please i'm telling you it is like, let me ask you this, Gordon. Someone that sold yeah. ten billion, someone that sold that, someone, some act that that yeah. that earned themselves, yeah, the rare diamond, ten million sold mm -hmm. album. How many people out of that ten million bought it again and again and again the same record? Right, of course, yeah. Nobody did. Hardly, maybe once or twice. <laughs> right, but but what they're finding in the artist that has garnered that billion streams, yeah, they found out there's a large number. Oh yeah, because everyone's they, listening to it twenty times. Like you listen to the old records or the CDs or whatever, you turn it on, on and on again. And so a stream is the same thing. It, it's it's ridiculous. The way they tally is ridiculous. But remember, before sound scan, it wasn't too different. You know, people were wondering, well. We got to come up with a new way where the numbers are real. It was the same thing in 92, if my memory serves me correctly, because our first record had just come out. Uh, the first sound scan billboard was a very big deal. Sound scan was the new way they had to figure out the stats. We need a real way that makes more sense because it's just, you know, it's the Wild West right now. So let me ask you this, Gordon. Like, so your first bands that, that you came up with, that you know it it you know you got attention national attention like do you think that you should have stuck it out longer in those bands or do you think like you pretty much carried it and pulled it all the way and as far as it was going to go well you know again it's a great question and um reagan has some really good thoughts on this i wish she, she was here right now I personally feel as though, so we had uh, Mystery Reality, which then took a break and we became Sam Hill and then became Highway 9. And each version of that band had a record deal and a publishing deal and a tour and, you know, got signed out of the pony, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was basically the same guys. So it was the same band uh, in concept. However, every time, you know, we were evolving, just like, you know, um, all of your favorite artists that with every record, there's a new 
uh, look and feel to their music, but it's still the same artist. And that was us. Um, I do at times feel as though I took a band for 15 years as far as I could. I believe by the time we were in Nashville with RCA, um, we had reached for the sake of what was happening in our personal lives. We, we all took it as far as we could together. And it was time to try to, you know, move forward separately and see what would happen. And that did take, you know, at the time, the three main members, it took us all in different directions. But I'll tell you, you know, the Beatles are only around for six, seven years, right? I had a band that sold about, you know, a millionth of those records. And I had that band together for 15 years. So I'm very proud of that. And the other thing I'm proud of is that that brotherhood uh, stays consistent to this day as a matter of fact uh peter and rob came and played with williams honor during the light of day benefit just a few months ago and it was a really special night so those are the kinds of things that are uh you know they last the test of time and sure would we have liked to have big hit singles and sell millions of records and like you know have big huge mansions and blah 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 of course who doesn't but well, you actually, you can today, Gordon. You can have all that today. You can. You can. And so that's like, that's what I'm here to tell you. Again, you know, it's part of um, what is William's honor. It's, uh, that's, that's what I'm doing here. I'm here and still doing this because I believe you can. You can make business. Or, or, or if you can't do it the legitimate hard work day, you could also have an option of doing it through the metaverse way. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Like, create a little uh, avatar and roll <laughs> really yeah absolutely <laughs> of course <laughs> listen there how you get there as long as you get there right know? right I, you know i mean you, you know i'm telling you gordon it's like we're living in you know when 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 mark zuckerberg said he was going to create the metaverse i'm like i think we're already living in the metaverse all right it does you know certainly through the pandemic when you know you're wondering, like I can't really, you're gonna stop me from coming into the supermarket getting food. Like this is not a world we could have ever imagined, you know. And so here we are. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about like creating your own reality, you know, being in the metaverse. But sorry, by the way, I'm very off today. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure if it's from like my allergies. Like I've been like having this brain fog. I don't yeah. know get the thing in the right here in the cranium i know and and i can't think and i can't really focus and think have you been you know like have you you know you can't even like think you can't create you can't do anything yeah they call it hay fever man when spring starts to happen and everything's blossoming the air gets crazy in our area it does does get really thick and you get those like weird tension headaches like right right have you noticed how thick the air is the last couple days yeah yeah it's it's getting Everything's sprouting out. That's why. Okay. Yeah. And I'm feeling very, very like off. But <laughs> so now let me ask you this When's the Williams Honor album coming out? Like you have a new album coming out. Yeah. So June 18th is going to be our release date. And that's a Wednesday. And again, one of those things, you know, we're not going to sit here and do the Friday release date. You know, we're going to do it our way the way we want to that we know our audience will appreciate and give them something earlier than that because they've been with us for so long and these are the people that buy the tickets and you know the real fan base um (laughs) what we're doing is may 1st the people that are we we just launched the pledge campaign um through indiegogo actually uh two days ago and so it's, it's like we're off to a great start it's very exciting for us um and so those people will get the first two singles may 1st and um, the record is uh, will be out June fifteenth, but I think what's going to happen is, as long as I get product when I think I'm getting it, they'll get it a little bit before that, and then the rest of the world will have it around that time. Now, did you did you produce that album? Sorry, did I say June fifteenth? Yes, June fifteenth. That's, that's a Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting <laughs> no, back. June no, now did you produce the album yeah man so you know again my day job 
through all these years before I got pulled back into the band business is, you know, artist development and co-writing and, and um, making records for people. So that's with William's honor. That's what we have been doing from the beginning. Um, and I just, you know, I live for recording and producing and it gets me up every day and I just absolutely love it. So we go back and forth from here to Nashville and um, we do all the stuff uh, on our own. And yeah, I produce all the stuff and Reagan and I write all the songs together. And uh, sometimes I'll pull some tracks out of Nashville, but most of the time I like to record everything right by the beach because there's not a lot of people that have done country music, country by the sea, as we like to call it. It hasn't happened a lot in New Jersey. So I record it now. Do you have a home studio? Do you work out another studio? Yeah. So I actually live in my studio of four rooms and there's a recording room, a mixing room, a writing room. And my kitchen is a great rehearsal room, actually. So you live in your recording studio. Yeah. Gordon, you are a true musician. <laughs> it doesn't stop here ever. You know, even when uh, it's funny when people um, I'm watching a lot of younger kids coming up that, you know, are, are talented. You know, I'll, I'll go see somebody that I, I've discovered on socials and, you know, they're like really great and they're, they're writing good songs. They sing really well. And, uh, you know, I'll just poke around if they're from the area and be like, so, you know, like, what's up? And I'll get stories like, ah, oh, well, they're going to go to college. And like, you know, they don't see a future in music. It's, it's so mind boggling to me because from day one, you know, it was this or the gutter. And many times it's come to the gutter and I've been okay with that. Cause I've always roped it back in. Um, but I've always felt like if you want to do this, you got to do it with everything you got, or you just, it's almost now it's impossible. If you don't give it everything you have, it's truly impossible. Um, but like we were saying before, it's not just about the music anymore. You have to build a brand. And that's where it's really evolved to where the music is like your business card for what you are, your beliefs, maybe, you know, how you feel about life and people see the reflections of themselves in you. And that is what sells the music, you know? Um, so you, you have to create a brand that, you know, is, is your personality. And that's a key to all of this. All right, Gordon. Well, listen, I love, I love the, um, I love the chat. Like I said, um, it, it's just, it's just great that how after all these years you kept the music alive you kept the spirit alive and you didn't give up i mean no. it's it's okay. it, i it, it's it's commendable that that is what william's honor is truly about if you have to define it it's about sticking to your guns second chances always keeping your eye on the prize and never ever giving up that is truly what defines what we are as a band and that's why i am still here june 15th wednesday yeah. now that's on spotify and everything uh it should be i think we're gonna make sure that our fan base has it first and then it might be just a little bit after that for stream but yeah all right all right gordon i'm gonna check it out can't wait and um we'll make sure you get your own copy before that date thank you gordon i appreciate it and um we'll be in touch great thank you very much dean Thanks, Gordon. Talk to you soon.